unlike most workshops that we do here, I'm going to, I'm going to minimize uh, talking about, about the metaphysics of the course, which I almost always emphasize. Uh, when we talk about the ego, which we will invariably do, uh, I, will, I will not dwell on some, some of the gory details, as I usually do. Uh, the focus will be much more on what healing is rather than what on healing is not. Uh, that doesn't mean that we won't get into some, some metaphysics, of course, because that, that always is the backdrop for, for everything that we teach in the course. Uh, but the focus will be, be a little different. Uh, we'll be talking about healing, uh, which is not, not unusual for us here, but I'm going to be talking about it from, from the perspective of music and use music as a, as a kind of a framework within which we could talk about what healing is uh, in all its different forms. Um, and I thought, uh, as a general introduction to what we'll, we'll be discussing, I would discuss a little bit about my own background with music and specifically focus on three experiences I had many years ago uh, with Beethoven, Schubert, and Wagner as, an ex as really as examples of principles uh, that, uh, that are so, so central in the course and, and so uh, inherent in, in the course's teachings on healing and the practice of healing. Um, in one sense, I think this is a, one of the more important workshops I've done uh, in focusing on what, what it really means to be a student of the course in terms of how we are with each other. Uh, everybody knows that the basic message of the course is forgiveness, uh, but the practice of it, as almost everybody knows, is very, very difficult. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, the, the workshop today will, will zero in exactly why it is so difficult and how one overcomes that, because in the end, if we can't be more loving, more kind, and more gentle with each other, then there's no point in anything in this course. All right. uh, the principal focus, as you could tell from the uh, title, will really be on learning how to hear what's happening in the other person, how to listen to what is really going on in the other person. Without that ability to really hear, uh, there's no way you could be helped of help. Indeed, what you would end up doing probably is, is reinforcing the very problem that you're, you're committed to undoing, both in others and in yourself. And again, music, I think, offers us a wonderful uh, a way of, of looking in, at all of this. So again, I, I want to begin by talking a little, more, a little personally about my own background with music and how, it, in a sense, it, it kind of uh, uh, led me to the, to the course itself. Um, I want to start when I was in high school, when, when two, two events occurred that, that in retrospect were obviously very significant for me. Uh, one was that I began reading Freud. I was a junior in high school, and I, I was an avid reader, and I'd heard Freud's name mentioned in a class in school, and I was looking in the library one, one day, and I came across a, a little book, which is kind of a, a, a summary of Freudian theory, and I began reading it, and I fell in love with it and I began to devour everything I could read about Freud and Freud himself. Uh, I'd, at one point in that, that period, I read The Interpretation of Dreams, and, and God knows what I understood. I think, I was, again, I was only about 16 years old. But, uh, but I recognized that there was something really important in his work, and then I, be, I began reading other theorists as well. And it was at that point I decided that I'd become a clinical psychologist. Uh, and in, in a sense, I never wavered from that until actually I was midway through, through graduate school. But I became very, very focused that that's what I would do. And uh, I majored in psychology in college. I went on to, to graduate school, et cetera. Uh, roughly that same time, I began to develop an interest in classical music. Uh, my mother felt that, that it would be nice if uh, my brother and I were exposed to, to music. So she joined a couple of uh, record clubs. And so, so we began listening to uh, classical music. And again, this was probably my, my second or third, third year in high school. Uh, one of the record clubs that we joined was RCA Victor, which at that point had as their introductory uh, gift uh, the Tuscany recording of the nine Beethoven symphonies. And so that opened up the world of Beethoven for me. And, and, uh, and while I loved almost all classical music, uh, his music really, really grabbed me like, like no other. Uh, and, and for the next probably 10, 15 years, I think, again, in retrospect, uh, it, it was obvious that, that Beethoven really acted like, like a spiritual director or a spiritual guide for me. Uh, at that period of my life, I was not interested in religion. I was not interested in anything spiritual. But I could feel something in his music unlike anything else that I had felt in my life or certainly in any other uh, composer's music. Uh, when you look at Beethoven, one of the, 
the reasons he is so, so popular, aside even from his music, is that unlike any other artist, you could see throughout his work like the whole scope of spiritual development. Uh, uh, commentators usually break his music into three, three periods, early, middle, and late. And, and you could see right from the beginning uh, up to the end, again, that, that he, he was resolute in his pursuit. Uh, not necessarily consciously, but that they, but you could again trace one's spiritual development through through his music. Uh, one one uh, English uh, music scholar, Marion Scott, in her book on Beethoven, uh, divided the three stages this way, or talked about it this way: that the early stage was when uh, when Beethoven looked at the material world through material eyes, and that's the the period when when he was very heavily under the influence of Mozart and Haydn, uh, the so-called so classical period. Uh, where, where the emphasis is on form and, and the works are very, very structured. Uh, and that, that, that basically takes, takes us uh, to the first two symphonies of Beethoven, his first two piano concertos, uh, first six quartets, a whole slew of piano sonatas, etc. cetera. Uh, the second period is middle period, uh, Marion Scott said, is when Beethoven looked at the spiritual universe through material eyes. And that's the, the period of his most popular music. It, began with the Eroica Symphony, his third symphony, and goes through the, the Eighth Symphony, then the, uh, his last three piano concertos, violin concerto, his opera, and uh, the middle quartets. Uh, and again, this is the most accessible of his music. Uh, and you can feel in this music not only the great power that, that is kind of a characteristic of Beethoven, but, but the beauty uh, and the development of the works, both within each individual work as well as from work to work. Again, it's almost like a window to his soul. And as I was listening to his music more and more, that's what I could really begin to, to, to intuit and feel it in myself. Uh, the third period, which is the, the end, is when he began to look at the spiritual world through spiritual eyes. And this is by far his greatest music, and I would venture to say probably the greatest music ever written. Uh, Mozart is always in a separate category. You don't even talk about Mozart. He's, uh, Rossini once was asked who the greatest composer was, and he said, with, but without hesitating, Beethoven. And the question was, well, what about Mozart? And he kind of said, well, again, Mozart's in a different category. So. Uh, but the late music of Beethoven is unlike any other, and what we're talking about there would be the Ninth Symphony and the Missa Solemnis, which is his great mass, which really formed the bridge between the, the, the middle period and the late period, uh, his last piano sonatas, and above all, his last quartet, which is the acme, I think, of any spiritual uh, uh, artistic work. And um, at, at some early point in my listening to Beethoven, I had read about these quartets, and I, I began listening to them, and I remember saying to myself, in effect, I'm not ready for these at all. It was like totally beyond where I was. But they stood for me as like a, a lighthouse. I was always kind of casting light, saying, this is where it's at. And I really began to see, again, looking in retrospect especially, that everything that was going on in my life was kind of getting me closer and closer to really hearing what was in that music. Um, and what was going on in my life at that point was, was basically a two-track uh, experience. On the one hand, I was, I was very clear about, about becoming a psychologist and doing everything that I should do uh, to, to make that happen. At the same time, aware that everything I was reading, everything I was studying, had nothing to do with the level of experience that I could feel in music, and especially in Beethoven's music. And as my later college years went on and then on into to graduate school, and I began to, to really hear those, those late quartets. I realized that, that no psychologist came anywhere near in touching that. And I realized that that, that I don't know what I called it, uh, was, was really the only thing that was important.